Um, welcome. So we are just going to talk a little bit about the exhibition. I think um, because we have Deborah and Chand uh, Chandra here, we're also going to. Um... Hi, Petra. Hey. Welcome. Um, we're also just going to have an open conversation. And so I was going to do some screen share and show, just kind of go over some of the images. And I think it would be wonderful if we could hear from the artists, because I have my interpretations of the work, but I think it's always nicest to hear from artists. So um, I started, I was talking to a colleague yesterday and she was like, what is this rhombus space? And I was like, well, let me just go back to the beginning. I started it in 2013 in Brooklyn out of my studio and I hosted some really great shows. Petra was in a show. Um, I think you were in the postpartum party, right? That was the show it was about artists who had <laughs> recently had babies and like the work that they made in response to it um, or in related, in connection to the changing conditions, either like it was in the narrative of the work or like the scale, like one person was working exclusively on his kitchen table making sculptures. So all these like food sculptures emerged. But okay. um, Rhombus Space comes out of my interest in curating and in showing work. And I feel like a few of us here are, have a diverse interest in like how we connect to art. Because art, like, yes, there are artists who exclusive, exclusively make art, but a lot of artists teach and show and write. And it's really, I think, an extension of expression and the general dialogue. I want to say something about that. Yes, I also please. think it's, um, it's a very accessible thing to let people know that that's really how artists practice. They are art workers. They help and serve other artists promote their shows and make work and have space and get written about as well as make art individually and i think we've come from a place where we have to kind of make a show and be on top of the pyramid as the great artists but in reality we're really part of a community and it takes a lot of artists to make sure that one artist does very well and really we're more collective than that and more diverse. It's okay to be plural with our practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I've had dealers in the past say, like when I say, when I get really excited about teaching and they're like, do you have to do that? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I, first of all, I do have to, but I also really enjoy it. <laughs> you know, it's a reciprocal um, experience. And, you know, there's also artists whose work like Joseph Boy's or others mm -hmm. who've seen pedagogy as part of their um, creative ex you know, expression. So um, this show, Growth, is the first of four online exhibitions. Um, it's in response to the changing kind of context for viewing art and experiencing art and showing art that's evolved out of the pandemic. I mean, there were online shows before, but now it's really like there are lots of galleries that are closing because of economics or conditions and are going um, just online or they're supplementing their on-site shows with extensive online viewing experiences. So it felt like a very manageable and very exciting area um, to sort of explore. So the show features um, Ward Yoshimoto, Kay Tausches, Mel Press, Damien Olson, Rhea Hurt, Petra Gupta Valentova. Medora Fry and Samantha Batra Meta. So the initial concept for all these shows is that I was gonna, I invite four artists to then reach out to their network and invite one other artist um, to uh, round out the exhibition. And there's a very simple theme for each exhibition. So this one is growth. Um, and I kind of thought it would be, it made a lot of sense to me and it, felt like a nice match to match it to the season. So like spring is growth, summer is intensity, fall is bounty and winter is reflection. Um, so I thought maybe we can share um, some images of the show just to get everyone um, kind of on the same page. Let me go um, here to Chrome. Okay, 
So, so um, first up is Petra Gupta Valentova. She has two works in the show. And this is a large scale um, block print resist glue uh, print with hand stitched embroidery. Um, Petra, can you talk a little bit about your work and your process? Yes. <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, so that large piece is actually right behind me um, in the studio and I'm working on more um, hand embroidery. Uh, so uh, the, the, the piece that, uh, the first one, um, or the flower, uh, it uh, is a part of the series that uh, was created uh, two summers ago as a part of art residency where, which was happening in a garden in the Czech Republic mm. where I'm from. And so past few years, I am uh, by practice a multimedia artist, sculptor, but past few years, I did a PhD in Czech Republic at Academy of Arts, Architecture and, um, and Design, uh, working on collaborative design with artisans in India, where my husband is from and Czech Republic. And so the, uh, whatever I do, I look at it conceptually. And for me, uh, the biggest part of my PhD project was uh, to respect uh, intellectual and cultural rights of a community of traditional printers. And, um, and I was uh, coming up with a, a design uh, system that would give the voice to the to the traditional women printers that I work with, or I cannot say traditional, but indigenous, um, and strip uh, the way how we work with them uh, away from any kind of power position or, or colonial sort of approach. So, uh, so that was what brought me to block printing. Uh, uh, and from blood, yeah, so this is the piece that was done in Czech Republic. And a lot of uh, motives for block printing that we were using were coming from earth and from plants around. So uh, these two pieces are sort of combination of two different things that I've been doing, uh, but they come together with the topic of, uh, of earth, of, uh, of uh, handwork, of the craft, invisibility of craft, invisibility of, uh, of women's work often or craftsmen's work. Uh, so this, this big piece, it's a, a resist print uh, on canvas that was done in Czech Republic uh, in a blueprint workshop uh, that I work with. And a blueprint, uh, old technique, uh, one of the oldest techniques of uh, decorating fabric, uh, was is still quite alive in Eastern Europe or Central Europe. And uh, three years ago, this technique was included in a UNESCO cultural heritage. Uh, hi, Madara. Uh, and uh, so this is a workshop that I work with. Uh, the, the motif of a correct art is my own that, uh, that I designed and created. And so through COVID, I took this piece that was sort of imperfect and, and I spent months and months embroidering my, my, my own cracks or my own uh, ways uh, in the surface. And uh, I used a very light uh, stitch and, uh, and uh, how could it, a thread. Uh, to create sort of invisible uh, lines between what was already defined uh, in a fabric. And uh, the process was very uh, calming uh, through the you know, pandemic. It took, uh, it was very, uh, it was very uh, meditative process uh, that I sort of was escaping to while taking care of my kids and, and everybody and while being away from my practice and from my work. I was basically just a uh, homebound as a, as a mother. So this was a sort of uh, very invisible, slow process uh, that uh, reflected uh, very well the months and months of being uh, enclosed uh, at home. But also it was a homage to uh, invisibility of craft and, uh, and a women's work and, 
and all these uh, people who are working in a society and are not recognized and we can't see them. So that's, uh, that's, that's this big piece. So you can't really see the complexity, but I've been working on it for a month, for a year. And, uh, and it's sort of supposed to draw you in and then you start seeing these other lines only when you, um, when you are close to it. So when you really look, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and this really, your PhD dealt a lot with fashion. And well, textile. it dealt with the textile and with the block printing, but it dealt mainly with the approaching. How do we approach the, the craftsmen in different country? And, uh, and uh, is it ethical to call uh, just using the, the, the technique uh, sustainable without respecting the community and uh, the whole culture and intellectual knowledge that is behind the craft? Right. Okay, very, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, Thank you. So uh, this is Medora Fry's work. I know she just joined us too. Um, these are from a very recent series. So why don't you tell us, uh, Medora, about this work? Okay, is my camera on? I can't tell. <laughs> it is. Yes, it's okay. on. Okay. Hi, everyone. Happy lunchtime. Um, uh, this work came, I I've been making work outdoors periodically, sporadically through the years and photographing it. I had a series of photographs that I was making from walks that I conducted in New York City when I lived in there, lived there. And um, the images were very much full of natural things as well as broken glass and uh, debris from the street. Um, and then when the pandemic came, I lost use of my studio for several months. And uh, frankly, I was really stuck anyway. I was pretty bored with what I'd been doing. And I think I was getting into the habit of going to my studio and getting on my computer the whole time. <laughs> so it was really nice that I had no choice but to go outside. My space at home isn't really set up for art making. And I began hiking and taking materials out on the trail with me, assembling them and photographing them. And then uh, I was approached by Burnaway Magazine, a publication for the Southeast uh, for the arts to actually create some works for uh, their mood ring column. Uh, and I happened to be going on a trip to Sedona, Arizona, which is the only time that I've traveled during the pandemic and essentially just spent the entire trip outdoors making these assemblages, frustrating my partner, <laughs> um, you know, just really experimenting. The nice thing about uh, making these kind of images is that you can really play with color and form and not have to concern yourself with the logistics of making it stick together. Um, so I found it very liberating and I'm continuing to work this way. I have a show coming up at Kamea's Gallery uh, in May and I'm planning on presenting some images from uh, this series, hopefully some new ones that were created in Georgia. Um, so yeah, that's my plan for that show. Medora, can you talk a little bit about your search for the sublime or luminosity in this work? Yes, uh, so my prior practice of, I guess 15 years ago, I came out of a very traditional painting school, the New York Academy, where I was making very academic um, Renaissance technique based paintings. Uh, they tended to be female in landscapes and they were really a response to the other paintings that I had been exposed to art historically, which were made by men and typically depicting women sitting in the grass receiving the male gaze. And so 
I liked this idea of making images of women who were active in the space and really owning their environment. Um, I, I, soon, I soon came to feel that that language was really not speaking to me um, and very limited. Um, perhaps it was, there was no space for the viewer in my opinion. And I began working abstractly and returning to this idea of landscape, but really talking very much about the transcendence the transcendent qualities that I experience uh, when hiking or walking in a city, nature, um, the materials that I choose. I like to choose things like translucent glass, neon light. Um, and those things are all a reference to spirituality, but also the industrial aspects of them interest me. Um, so, I like this idea of, of saturating the image with something that's even more euphoric than what you can capture in a simple image. Um, so showing you what is unseen and more of what is felt there. Yeah, the, you know, there's always that um, attempt to capture a sunset that always fails as a photograph. Mm -hmm. But here you get like through these transparencies and reflections, this melding of like the sky and the earth and then the geometry and the organic shape. It's a really um, beautiful balance between these usually very contrasting forms or elements. Um, well, I also like, uh, I also like using mirror because it creates this unreal space. Um, it gives, it lends the image a surreal quality um, gives you the sense that there are windows and portals to pass through. Um, I like the idea of confusing you a bit with um, these materials, you know, them being mistaken as flat planes of color when they're actually a piece of glass, for instance. Okay, great. So let's continue. Hi, Ria Hurt. Thanks for joining us. Um, I don't think Damien is with us right now, but I had a chance to do a studio visit with him that I'll edit and post in the future. He's a um, Brooklyn-based, Williamsburg-based artist, and he very much kind of goes around and collects things. Um, Karen spoke in the beginning about artists, you know, it's very natural for artists to write and to show other artists and to be part of a community, like be sort of multifaceted and Damien is very much a multifaceted artist. He's an accomplished um, musician. He has a long history in dance and I think capoeira as well. Um, and he goes and he makes paintings and sculptures. He's very much a maximalist. Um, and he collects, he sources materials from building sites or demolition sites mm -hmm. in um, Brooklyn and then reassembles them to create these creatures and or sculptures and on his process of making these works he doesn't have a definite outcome mm -hmm. like in mind in terms of the form it's more that he you know responds to the material as many of us do in our own practice that very intuitive approach but very also structured balance rhythm mm -hmm. symmetry as in this piece ostrogoth um. Yeah, and he um, he's always exploring, but it's it's very much. I thought that his work um, really fit the theme of growth, in mm -hmm. that it has this sort of um, cumulative, abundant building. Mm -hmm. He's working on this huge um, sculpture, kind of based on the idea of Babylon, with like stacking wood, but mm -hmm. also <laughs> stacking stones, like huge um, spires of material. Okay. So let's continue. This is Samantha Batra Mehta, and she um, has lived on several continents. Um, she is based in New York and um, has shown actually at one of the Trestle galleries. Um, this is the first time I've worked with her directly on a show. So she's interested in um, botany and 
botanical illustrations and patterns in her, her work, I see a lot of reference or homage to miniature painting and traditional botany. Um, the work is an exploration of identity and also issues around gender and gender identity with kind of some, um, some parts of surrealism. So these are two prints, Light from Another Sun 5 and Light, Light from Another Sun 3. Mel, um, who's joined us today, love to hear what you have to say about your work. Thanks for including me. It's so nice to see everybody. And I'm so thrilled to be in a show with um, amazing and accomplished people. And Katerina, thank you for setting this up today. It's really nice. And yeah, and I don't love public speaking. So it's kind of fun to sit in my studio and public speak with uh, the comfort of paintings around. Um, uh, yeah, so my work deals with um, line and color uh, as a means of perception and um, so much of uh, what people have said already uh, really resonates with me in terms of nature and the sublime. I, I get all of my color from nature. Um, and in, in over the pandemic, um, our studio building was locked for a months and so um, it's been great to be back in here. Um, much of my work uh, does deal with like experiences that I'm not trying to literally transmit but in, find a way to evoke in painting. So um, this actually is an older painting um, that had a lot of lives. Um, it was orange at one point um, and glow in the dark. I love like glow in the dark and metallic and glitter. Um, <laughs> wearing some of um, Rhea's glitter earrings right now. Thank you, Rhea. Um, so um, this work and the next work are really about sound, um, which is new for me. I, I am normally more visual um, in my uh, influences, but I think over this period of time, is having trouble accessing color, which is one of my main focuses. And so um, this painting is called Listening for Owls. And during the pandemic, um, well, as it's still going on, I live in San Francisco. And so one of the things that my husband and I would do to travel is like we would take these really long bike rides in Golden Gate Park uh, and we would do it at nighttime. And so we would go out and we would go listening for owls and trying to like track owls through the park and riding out to the ocean beach and sort of looking into the nothingness and everythingness of mm -hmm. the end of a continent. And, you know, like just experiencing um, what isn't, you know, visible. So that's um, where this painting comes from, um, just this way of, sort of being in a space and feeling feeling um, presences that aren't visible. Um, yeah, and then the, the former painting um, doesn't exist anymore. Um, also has that sort of movement and this has a lot of mica in it, which is a little bit hard to see, um, but uh, it has also lost its like squareness because it's been, um, loved and overworked and you know sanded and repainted so many times you can see the like the upper left hand corner is like <laughs> um you know which i i kind of love you know that it's uh it's um it's not Bobby, Bobby. yeah and it's not the hard-edged abstraction of um you know the past so yeah it's interesting that you bring music into it because one of the things that I really noticed was that real strong optical effect and how like there's the dark blackish blue and then like there's a blue glow that comes and it definitely feels very it's like very pulsating energetic um, both of them are so very interesting do you are you listening to music while you work at all is that part of your studio practice? Um, 
No, I hate to say I kind of listen to podcasts because like the drone of the voice just makes this like bubble that I can go mm. into the painting and I'm not thinking about what people are saying really. Um, right. <laughs> or like, I think music is so emotional, honestly, that I, I have so much connection to different songs. Like it brings me to a place. Triggers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I, you know, I listen to a lot of 80s music lately and I'm like, I remember when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you have to have a really steady hand to do this. So I, you know, the process, just like, Petra's work has this like kind of slow, deliberate, almost invisible process. Um, Yours definitely has a very, you know, it's kind of like you have to control the environment or else you have to like repaint a section. How do you do that? Right, and I really um, can relate to what Petra was saying about just the, you know, sort of the the labor and the meditative quality. Like, I think that's the space I want to get to is feeling in there um you know that that philip gustin quote everybody knows about you know you go into your studio and you bring all these people in with you and like as you stay there like you know they start to leave and like you know if you're lucky you leave too i you know i just murdered the quote but it's something like that you know where basically you you stay long enough and you can let so much go that that you're just there oh yeah i don't i don't know that quote but i'll look it up okay good (laughs) I, I I ruined it, but it, you know, yeah. that idea of losing the self a little bit. Speaking of losing the self, this is uh, Karen's work. Let's hear from you. I love that Petra used the word invisibility of craft because invisibility is really at the essence of almost everything I do. I have a kind of panic about loss and a certain psychic sense. I grew up, well, I like to say when people ask me where I'm from, that I'm not from anywhere. I'm from America. I'm from the American suburbs. And in the American suburbs, in my experience, my family would move into an area that was completely wooded, streams, flowers, animals. And over the course of living there, it would disappear. In front of my eyes, I would see it um, developed. And so I come to this point where I'm just totally paranoid about empty space in a city. I mean, uh, I know many of you live in New York City where, you know, the rate of development is astronomical. But, you know, uh, once I was able to make roots and settle in one area in Atlanta, um, I found myself uh, in an abandoned city infrastructure because At that time, uh, so many people had moved out into the suburbs. And so we had a lot of empty space with nature actually taking space back. So I lived in this beautiful moment of cessation of development and had a wonderful coming of age romping through the empty lots and grassy fields uh, in between buildings. And then of course the time came where all that disappeared and I relived my childhood. And so this old series of photographs is kind of my attempt at documentary. I just wanted to document the things that I knew were going to disappear. I could kind of feel when something was about to go, it would get really ripe um, and have a kind of glow around it. And the pictures themselves were not that compelling. I went through a long process of um, what to do with these images. Uh, They weren't kind of classic documentary. Not really that into maybe printing them. Were they before and after? Were they videos? Like, what were they? Uh, But I just kept collecting them. And it was it was really neat to revisit them now. These were made, this one was made in 2007. And many of the buildings that I photographed um, have now completely disappeared. But I wanted to not do the Photoshop thing and make a pretty shape. I didn't want to show the, the quote unquote ugly building. I wanted to show the energy of the building. And so I decided that I would paint back the empty lot. So what I ended up doing is a hand painted disappearance. 
Uh, and then now I'm finding that, and you know, when I posted them online, when I printed them and framed them, which always seemed unsatisfying, um, I like to show the before and the after. And then I started to just show the empty space, the disappeared, the energy glowing. Um, I love this one in particular because it's a winter scene with that blue sky, so great. And you find that I would not have to do very much to um, camouflage the building. I mean, I like this one because it's pretty loose. Um, and this is a small print, it's about nine by 10 in real life. But now I've gone back to some of this collection and started to animate it now that we have these easy editing programs. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity because I hadn't really thought about these much. I've kind of moved on to ceramic transfers because there's so much more archival and I don't have to worry about frames. Um, but if you go to my Instagram page, uh, you'll see the animation version of this, um, which I've been really happy about. And I'm gonna try to post that as well. I just, it's like the next step. <laughs> No worries. For figuring so it out. Work. You've done a beautiful job. Thanks. And let's look at your other piece. Mm -hmm. So again, one of my just crazy rabbit holes of investigation. Um, my grandpa was a coal miner, and I had recently visited the coal mine where he had worked, which was, you know, uh, up in rural Pennsylvania, and I was shocked at myself for enjoying the experience. Uh, you know, uh, they have this crazy Lack Lackawanna coal mine museum and you can get in the cart and go down uh, into the mine itself, into the dark shaft. And I just was preparing myself for an emotional journey. I thought it was going to be very empathetic. I thought I was going to feel very empathetic to the suffering. I just thought it was going to be this purge. And it ended up being this like earth hug I mean, I went in there and, and I felt so, I mean, maybe because there was no toil left and it was just this black sparkly space and beautiful echoing drips. Um, but I just, I, I, I loved being under the ground and thinking about being inside mountains. And there's a great tradition of the magical mountain. And I, I started to see my grandfather's heritage, his, his labor as something else, something more magical. And this is kind of my perspective on development in general. Is like, it's very funny what we do, what humans do when we live in paradise, which is earth. You know, we kind of mess it up with these unappreciative developments, but then the paradise is still there. It's still there. You go to Florida and it's like this horrible beach parking lot instead of the undeveloped scape. But so I started to think about um, paper architecture. I, I love paper architecture because you don't have to build it yourself. You don't have to do the organization. You don't have to raise the funds. You can just picture it. And you know, that's one of artists great jobs is to be able to imagine um, maybe someone else can make this giant sculpture that I have created here. Um, so I went and found a bunch of images of mountaintop removal, which is one of the techniques they use in mining. Uh, this came on later after my grandfather had been long, long passed away. Um, but I was thinking about after we stop mining and after we need oil and all of the markings and, and scars we've made on the earth with what we've done for oil. And I was thinking about what a great monument that would be if we could put the mountaintop back on somehow. And so <laughs> these are just, and I was working with neon a lot um, because it's the perfect merging of a commercial lan language, the language of graphic design. And that's how I've traditionally made the most of my money as a graphic designer. So I know how cracked out graphics can be. So you know, to me, neon is that is that language, but then the image of nature and you put the two together and you have this very contemporary aesthetic. So I thought, oh, what if we could climb the mountaintop that was removed in the future to this big abstract monument of the new top, the spirit top, Kind of like that idea, 
kind of like that idea of putting a light up where a, a building had disappeared. But this was a, 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 an earth made monument that was disappeared. I have several of these from Florida as well. Uh, back when we had the crash in 2008, I went down to Florida and photographed a bunch of uh, interrupted developments on the coast when they were building these huge McMansions. And all you'd have were the columns where the building was supposed to go. And they make the most beautiful sculptures. They're like, solo wits and they don't even know it. <laughs> so it's just, you know, in my little graphic design, world. I just took the photographs in there and put some neon lights on there. So you've got sunset, you've got nature sunset, and you've got man sunset. Anyway, I'll never do that project because it'll just involve too much paperwork and fundraising and XYZ. But I can make paper architecture and maybe someone else will do it. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. And, and because of, um, the rendering skills, like we can really imagine it, you know? Listen, and my skills as a graphic designer have, the, the older I get, the more I, I felt very insecure as an artist who used graphics and all these other forms because I was not a traditional painter or doing something that was very gallery friendly. But as we've moved forward in time, I realized just how precious those graphic design skills are. Um, especially with editing coming online now. Like I'm finding a lot of the work I made 10 and 20 years ago are like suddenly having a new life now that I have the technology. Um, anyway, graphics is power. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree. I agree. I, I was a graphic designer too. And I don't think I would have ever learned the computer if I hadn't actually oh. gone to school for that. Um, and I mean, how do you update your website even without having those skills, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think what's interesting about these works, like, like for instance, this piece, it's like four lines, but it's really <laughs> impactful. You know, like we get it, we understand it. So I thought this was a really interesting series um, for the show. Um, these are Rhea Hertz works, so we can hear from the artist. Hi everybody, um, I just want to say to Katarina, thanks so much for bringing us together. Um, I was, <laughs> I'm like literally tearing up seeing people. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it's been a long time. <laughs> I don't think I've seen you in probably three years, two or three years, maybe. This is kind of like an art opening, especially with Chandra and Deborah. So thank you guys for being yeah. here. Um, yeah, so I guess um, the idea of growth has really been meaningful to me and throughout the pandemic and moving, because I moved across the country, there's been a lot going on. Um, but, you know, a lot of times these challenges I'm going to stop crying, I promise. Um, <laughs> they do, they push us and they, um, and it's like inevitable growth. Like, even if we don't want to grow, we will. And, um, and that's, I guess, the silver lining to a lot of um, pain and challenges. So um, this series here is um, one where I was really thinking about how to combine some different modes of art making. Um, so I, like Mel, I'm really focused a lot on color and um, sort of surface quality, reflective and um, transparent and opaque and kind of um, figuring out ways for them to sing next to each other. Um, and I work with um, imagery of nature, but also um, thinking about how industry and has changed color and how we how we have it around us. Um, so we have in the same block, and when I would walk around in Brooklyn or even here in Watsonville, California, you'll see a neon candy wrapper and like an egret taking flight. Like you'll just <laughs> have everything all the time. So um, developing this language of color and letting it be um, next to each other in a way that um, 
like Mel said, sort of translate some of these experiences we have walking around. Um, and with this work, I'm really thinking about the paper or the surface as a way to absorb or kind of move pigment. Um, and I work also on these larger wall installations. So these are also a way to get out some ideas for composition um, for a larger wall. But so I named this one composition in orange and then the other one is composition in I think violet, yeah. Um, and you can see that um, I'm mixing both uh, acrylic paint directly kind of like in a watery um, uh, iteration on the paper. And then I'm also using um, this kind of, it's an adhesive film that I've painted on and created some forms. And then I mix in different media so that it kind of, like the paint kind of falls apart a bit um, and then creates these patterns and gradients. So the paint itself can, can kind of almost return back to a mineral form. Basically, uh, the idea is that these sort of rock forms or um, petal forms, they can um, create their own compositions and um, be become sort of different versions of themselves in the same space, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the variety of textures that you're able to achieve, like the striation and then the more speckled one and then the grainy one is really impressive. Like you've really expanded your vocabulary um, in this work. And it's interesting that you and Medora and Karen are all interested in this sort of natural and natural coexisting. I was curious for your, you have, um, you'd mentioned before that you have a commission wall piece coming up. How do you prepare for that? Um, yeah, so um, I have two that are, have been on hold because of the pandemic. And um, one is going to take place in London and I don't, I still don't have dates yet for that um, in a private collector's home and then one is going to be in um, the Hamptons at another a different private collector's home. That I'm going in, in um, early April. So with those, um, I have photos of the walls and I have, um, so there's going to be some three-dimensional elements also. So like on my, on my website, you can see an example from um, an exhibition or a few examples. Um, but the first one that when you land on my website is um, an example of, an, of a wall installation that shows the three-dimensional elements and then the adhesive paper and then the direct application of paint on the wall. And it's sort of a pre preparation where I don't know exactly how it will turn out. So there's a lot of faith on the, <laughs> the side of the collector. Um, all I can do is sort of prep the materials ahead. So um, I have the adhesive back paintings that I'm working on. I have one in the car that I need to bring up. Uh, otherwise I would show you. Um, and then I cut the forms out that I know that I wanna be working with based on the scale. And then um, I have my paints and then I have the three dimensional elements which I can show you really fast a couple. Um, and those, um, I'm in my, my home. Did you see my PJ bottoms? <laughs> okay. So this is an example of one that I'll adhere to the wall. Um, and then, and then there's these, so like the painting can kind of go become layered behind it. Um, oh, and the idea is sort of like seeing through or around, um, kind of like, uh, the way we experience our walks um, or like when I go to the tide pools, you look in and the kinds of experiences that you feel of like having a discovery when you're looking at artwork. That's what I'm going for. So it's, it's basically prepping the supplies um, in studio and then um, showing up and then kind of an improv um, com combining of things. And then you just hope it looks good. 
<laughs> working and um, it takes a few days to make it right. Right. Well, good luck with that one. Yeah, I imagine it's nice to have some painted surfaces that protrude so you can really, it encourages like an engagement and um, moving around the objects. Um, all right, so let's go to the next one. This is Ward Yoshimoto's work. He was gonna join us, but he has another meeting. Um, this is called Growth Spurt, and he's using some pesticide containers, black vintage pesticide containers, black flag on one, and then the, the fake boxwood foliage. And to me, his work is um, cheeky and a little like on the edge of dealing with taboos or um, something that's both playful and a little charged. So this is both like a water gun, a spray gun and a phallus, and then a commentary about how we treat um, the natural environment. Um, he uses these sort of ball pit balls a lot that I think, you know, they connote um, play fun, but also sort of like this plastic Americana as well. Here they are again um, for a piece called Icoba Power. And Ward often uses this wire structure. He creates a lot of um, very elaborate sculptures with uh, chicken wire and linear wire. Um, and there's this definite additive maximal quality. So uh, the both Damien Olson's sculpture and Ward's have this like additive maximal, like sequential um, repeated elements in their work. He, uh, Ward is also a um, Brooklyn based artist. He grew up in Los Angeles. He's of Japanese American descent and his work usually uh, is either sort of a visual narrative assemblage or more abstract, but it often has like a social and sometimes political connotation. So ICOBA is an acronym for the Intentional Confluence of Brand and Art. And it has to deal with um, commerce and power and art as an exchange, as some sort of capital exchange, so. Okay, that's another view. I hate to interrupt, but I have to go. And I wanted, it's such a small group. I just wanted to say it was great seeing everyone. Hi. Well, thanks for thanks coming. For yeah, them. yeah. Thank and you. I loved hearing about everyone's work. Bye. Um, All right, bye. Um, so that is perfect timing because it's the end of the slideshow. What I, I, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop the share um, the screen share. And then I thought we could um, just talk for a little bit and uh, share like what's coming up next. We heard from Rhea about your next project, or if you want to talk about um, some of you've already mentioned a little bit how the pandemic has affected your studio practice. Um, but yeah, anything just to sort of round out. So I, um returned to the studio after many years. I am now a month uh, yeah, having a studio uh, in Bronx. And it's definitely uh, interesting. I do fight a lot my insecurity, uh, you know, returning to the work, like everything I've been doing was either um, uh, connected to, the, to my PhD research or to uh, very quiet work around it. So I'm sort of feeling like I'm coming up um, yeah, yeah, from a shell and, um, and uh, I always worked a lot. So I think just going through the process of creating and creating and not really thinking about it too much and too deeply uh, will lead to a more complex uh, thing. So I am grateful that uh, Rina, that you invited me to the show and I do miss uh, uh, community and miss uh, talking to people, seeing others work, putting th things in a perspective uh, and my own practice and my own feelings. So uh, thank you for uh, your words, all of you, and for the work, because I see a lot of 
uh, similarities in the thinking process and, uh, and in, the, in the work. And uh, so this is just for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen, can you share? Sure. You said you have a live Instagram <laughs> live event coming mm -hmm. up. So like a true multidisciplinary artist, I have a curation, my very last at an institution that I have been at for eight years. And um, during the pandemic, I really enjoyed dropping out for a minute. And I realized just how much I missed being a sincere nature loving art maker. I had been in the gallery scene promoting other artists for so many years and it just kept getting more and more hard edge. And again, before what I would call the consciousness shift that happened this year, uh, being a gallerist and helping others. I always got into curation because it was making an essay with other people's art. I'm very much an idea person. Um, and I love designing the exhibition and designing the graphics for the show. Um, but more and more, it was so much, um, God, I hope I don't get in trouble here, but so much narcissism, so many big personalities that I found myself more and more in the service position instead of the creative position. Anyhow, my last show is a crazy political show called The Shit That Americans Like. And it's, <laughs> it's about parades and, and protests. And um, so I have an artist talk on Saturday. And of course, it's an uncanny timing on the show because we had the inter insurrection on the 6th. And now we're having another event right here in Atlanta, a mass killing. And so it's just like, <sighs> I'm trying to balance my heart to be able to go in and do this heavy talking and represent this artist who's wonderful, but I really am ready to go into love of nature and conservation mode. Uh, so that's the next thing, like literally next week, I'm starting on a video essay project with another partner. And I've been practicing with my video editing. Um, so I hope that'll be this next year's project. Very exciting. And Mel, what about you? Yeah, I feel like I'm, um, you know, growth is an apt title for this moment. I think, you know, I'm feeling, um, you know, so happy to be back in studio and feeling excited about, like, thinking about a future again, <laughs> you know, like the now and also like what we want to create. And so, yeah, working on a couple of curatorial ideas and, you know, starting to have studio visits with people and, um, you know, just contributing to auctions and really doing what I can to support, you know, that I think, you know, this time has been so much about community, even though we're separate and just feeling how we all are connected to one another and how we can support one another through small or large actions. So, yeah, so thinking about what you know, how to contribute, how to create more of what we want to see in the world, and you know. Yeah. Amen. Can I ask you, what is that piece behind you? Is that a wall piece or a big drawing or a rubbing? What am I, the blue one? This is a giant painting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, is that ac acrylic on canvas? Oh yeah, I see the shadow now. On panel, yeah, sorry. Oh, I on panel. I am like such a 2D thinker. I cannot like all the camera stuff. I'm like, where is it? What is it doing? <laughs> anyway, it's a big five foot square painting. <laughs> wow. And Deborah, sh share with us. You're also a great abstract artist. So share with us what, what's happening with you in your world. Um. Well, first of all, thank you all for allowing me to learn about your process and see what you're up to and what a wonderful show. So it was a real delight to uh, get out of my own head for a while. Yeah, so I'm in New York City and uh, just staying out of the way, you know, staying healthy. Got my first vaccine. Um, my studio, fortunately, is where I live. So I'm working away. Uh, also cooking up some curatorial ideas and yeah, just, you know, just 
being. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, I think that was, it's almost been an hour. So I feel like this is a good time to wrap it up. And um, I was going to, I sent out an email about getting some pictures of you guys in your studio spaces, just to kind of share about your artistic practices. Um, so we'll fe feature that on Instagram and we can do, we'll figure out some things about, around studio visits and stuff, but this was really nice. This was nice to really hear about your own work in your own words. So thank you everyone. And I'm gonna end the meeting and sign thank everything you. off. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.